everyone, welcome. We are uh, starting a few minutes early just to let everybody come in. And so um, get situated, get a, a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, whatever you need, and we will be starting in a few minutes. People are still coming in, so welcome to our webinar about bird banding. We're just giving everybody a few minutes to come in and also join us on Facebook Live. So uh, sit back, relax, and we will get started very shortly. It's four o'clock, but we're just gonna wait one or two more minutes so that people who are finding their email, finding their link, finding their registration can uh, join us. The Facebook Live should be starting in the next few seconds. So hi everybody on Facebook. We are just waiting one or two more minutes to make sure everybody uh, has found us and then we will go ahead and get started. I think most people are in, so we will go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, my name is Erica Zambello. I'm the Communications Director for Audubon Florida, and I'm so excited to welcome you to Bird Bling, How Banding Birds Aids Conservation. So before I turn it over to Adam, our shorebird biologist here at Audubon Florida, I just want to do a few housekeeping things. So because we're a large group, right now we have um, audio and video turned off. However, if you want to ask a question at any time, just put the question in the chat. You can see the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And you'll be able to uh, ask anything at any time, but we're going to save all the questions for the end. For those of you tuning in on Facebook Live, feel free to leave your question in the comments and you will also either answer right away if, if we can or we'll wait till the end and ask Adam. This will be recorded and it will be posted on our um, Audubon Florida webpage. So watch for that. We'll be posting it, um, a note on Facebook when it's ready. And other than that, I think we're all set. So Adam, thank you so much. Take it away. All right, thank you, Erica. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us for about an hour today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about bird banding, um, more specifically how bird banding aids in conservation, how it helps us save birds. Not necessarily the process of banding, but what we learn and how learning what we learn helps these birds. We're not just banding birds to ban birds. So first, I'm going to go over a little bit, you know, why we, why we ban birds, why we trap birds, put these bands on them or these tags so we can follow them across their migrations and movements. Um, we're trying to better manage the birds. So really, we're trying to inform management is one of, the, one of the reasons. So we can identify individual birds. We can follow them in space and time. It lets us know about wintering sites, the importance of breeding colonies, track seasonal movements. We learn about migration. We can determine how long birds live. We can determine June uh, survival. And I think this last bullet point here, <clears throat> something that I think gets overlooked a little bit, it allows us to tell a good story. 
So all of those things, I suppose, are telling the bird's story. How long does it live? Where does it go? Where does it forage? All of those things. But just banding a bird and seeing the results of that banding shows us the amazing lives that these birds live. So maybe it doesn't inform our management, but the story of that bird's life is usually jaw-droppingly awesome, if you ask me. So learning about that and conveying that to everybody and let everybody know how cool birds are and what they actually do day to day, year to year, traveling the hemispheres is really amazing. I think it's a really powerful tool to use in conservation. We can give our policy staff here at Audubon or at other places on these stories and they can tell policy makers. We can tell our neighbors, our friends. I mean, I do this a lot. I tell everybody that I know the things that I know about birds and some of the stuff is just so cool and it gets everybody interested in birds. So I think one of the really important things that we learn from bird banding and telling these stories is that we're spreading this word about birds around. People are realizing how awesome that they are and birds connect really everything together, in my opinion, more so than anything else on the planet really. Birds are almost everywhere. And as you can see here, these are the flyways across the globe. And this is how we have to represent it on a map. You can see all the colored lines. Birds are everywhere. And, you, and every time of the year, every season, there's birds moving somewhere. And this is how we have to show it. But I think if you think about it in a different way, if you imagine every bird on the earth towing a thin thread behind it, everywhere it went, it's pulling that thread, it's stitching everything together. In short order, what we would realize is that everything at ground level, almost all over the globe, is covered in thread, all the way up to 39,000 feet, maybe higher, all these places that birds travel. The surface of almost every water body would be covered in thread. Below the surface of most water bodies would be covered in thread. So if you think about it that way, birds are really connecting almost every inch of the planet together, and I think it's a good they're a good um, representative to represent conservation and environmental ethic. And by spreading these cool stories, I think we can bring more and more people into this fold that most of us here are in. So I'm gonna go over several examples of what we've learned by banding, the cool stories that we can tell from banding and, and kind of how this helps conservation. The first one I'm gonna use, of course, is a project that we're doing here in Florida. Um, I have a project down here where I am in Collier County, Florida, where we're banding black skimmer chicks. Um, I started doing that in 2017. A colleague of mine, Dr. Elizabeth Forey, started in the Tampa Bay area a couple years before me. And we're learning some interesting things. I mean, it's in its infancy right now as far as what, are, what we're learning as col colony managers. We're seeing, <clears throat> as you can see here with this map, we're seeing where we're reciting these birds. So people are out there community scientists, Audubon staff, other partners in the state, or just citizens on the beach with a camera are, are reciting these birds and feeding this information back to us so we can kind of make maps like this and we can see where the birds are moving around. And we're starting to see interesting things with site fidelity in the colonies and all these things that are very important for us as colony managers. What I'm noticing, and as I started this project down here, what seems to be even just as important, or I probably could argue more important, is that this is this banding that we're doing, you can see here in these pictures, um, is, in, is totally volunteer. So I go out there and everybody that assists me is a volunteer. Members of the community, some of my Audubon beach stewards, college students, and then down in that, on the right-hand side, um, Sean Cooley at the time was our communications manager for Audubon. He had come out and helped us and it really changed him and it made him more effective, I think, um, doing the job that he was doing for Audubon, Florida. And like I always say, like getting a bird in your hand really changes you. When someone hands you a baby bird on the beach, <clears throat> it definitely changes something in you. And I can't even describe what it might be. But it's a really powerful tool for us here down in Southwest Florida. We generated a lot of interest in the local community with this banding project. So a lot of people know that our banded birds are out there. And in turn, we have a lot of community scientists that are out there that are feeding us this on um, recite information. So they're out on the beaches. They get excited every time they see a banded bird on the beach. So it's really starting to spread and we're really starting to see the impact that this can have in the community. Here is um, a photo of, this is a bird C, C48. This is a bird shortly after I banded it. 
in 2017. This photo was taken by a volunteer on the beach. It's really good to get this kind of information, especially with these great photographs to document it. And then here's the same bird. This was taken not too long ago this summer, C48 as an adult raising a chick of its own. So for me, that's a really, it lets me know about the survival of these birds, how many of these birds I see returning to the colony. And it just gives me hope to see them feeding chicks of their own. And also the volunteers get very excited about it. And then more and more, this catches on in the local community. And just to tell a quick story about our banded skimmers in Florida, this past winter, there was a proposal from the county to build a parking garage at this place called Clam Pass Park. And Clam Pass Park so happens to have the largest overwintering flock of black skimmers in the Eastern United States every winter. A lot of the birds that I banded, of course, spend their winters there, and we know that through reciting. And also, lots of birds that were banded by friends and colleagues of mine, other Audubon staff in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Lindsay Addison for Audubon, North Carolina. All skimmers from those colonies are also in that flock of skimmers. So we took this information from reciting bands of our own and bands from other researchers, and we went to the county and we told them about this special place and that you know, if we disturb it too much, we're gonna be disrupting colonies up and down the East Coast. So they scrapped the plan completely to build a parking garage. There's no new human disturbance on the beach. And then they allowed us to, to put up a winter posting for those birds. So instead of increasing foot traffic, they actually let us post it to decrease foot traffic. So in essence, we were helping preserve the fitness of black skimmers that are breeding up and down the Eastern seaboard just by getting a community involved and getting them excited by getting them out there and reciting bands. So I think the biggest impact that this project down here has had so far is that, which is huge and has ripple effects all the way north to Massachusetts. This is a quick story, but this is a good story too. This is a brown pelican, of course, down here and all along the Gulf. This is an iconic bird. We see them everywhere. This is a great shot taken again by one of my volunteers, which most of the good photos in this presentation are taken by one of my volunteers down here in Southwest Florida. And this story is about a pelican, a banded pelican that was banded after it was rehabbed in 2010 after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I believe this bird was brought in to a center in Louisiana along with 31 other pelicans and it was rehabbed for about a month, cleaned, rehabbed and released with, with a band. And this is the bird right here, 78Z. This is that bird standing in a pine tree in Sanibel, Sanibel Island, Florida. This bird, um, a, a biologist in Sanibel took this photograph and when reported, this bird hadn't been seen since it was released. So it was released in 2010, recited for the first time in 2018, and it just goes to show and kind of reinforces that when there is a, a, a horrible incident like the oil spill, that collecting these birds and cleaning these birds and caring for these birds is important. I know there's some talk sometimes that it's not worth it or you know, it's, it's, it might be a waste of resources or something like that, but this bird I think proves that they all don't survive, but some do. And I think we need to go, especially in the world that I live in now, down here, beach by beach and bird by bird, they're all important. And I think this, this, we don't know too much about this bird from this band recite, but we do know that it was terribly oiled, impacted, by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, cared for by citizens, volunteers, and organizations. They cleaned it, they banded it, they released it, and it's still alive. So I think that's a really important, important message. This bird is a good symbol that these things are worth it when we do have to deal with these kind of disasters, that the, the, what we do actually makes a big difference. And now, this is gonna be my one, uh, my one switch where I don't talk about birds that make their living around salt water. That's kind of where, where I make my living, so I tend to talk mostly about that. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about boreal birds and boreal bird migration. This is just a quick map to just show you the migration routes of most boreal birds, how they're traveling across North America into South America. But I wanted to highlight this bird here. This is a black pole warbler. And if you look at this map next to this picture, you can see that this migration map doesn't look exactly the same as those ones on the previous page or the previous photo. This bird, even the ones that nest all the way over in Nome, Alaska, 
they had to cross North America to the east coast of the United States in maritime Canada. And then from there, they make a transatlantic flight down to South America, occasionally making a stopover. And this is really amazing only because this, is, this bird weighs, I think, less than an empty soda can. I'm not a songbird guy, but that's what I think that's a good description for this bird. And it flies across the entire entirety of North America to the East Coast. And it's not this map and not always just um, just up in New England. There's been they've been, you know, seen in North Carolina through this tagging program. Um, and then from there, they stay for about a month building up reserves and building up reserves until they can are ready and fit enough, put on enough weight to make that transatlantic um, flight. So here's just an example of one of these birds and you can see when it left, <clears throat> when it left on October 13th, flew for two days straight, all the way out across open ocean, wings beating millions of times during that flight, rested for two days and then continued on. And I think using examples like this, like this is a really clear example and it doesn't have to be this bird, it could be any bird, but initiatives like um, Audubon's commu um, Bird Friendly Community Program or Bird Friendly Backyards or Plants for Birds, anywhere along that migration route, any of those migration routes that you saw on that boreal bird map, if we had a network of those communities and backyards and plants for birds all along these routes, it would make a huge, huge difference for these birds. And even when a person asks, and I get asked this a lot, like what can one person do? And does it really matter if one person is out there reciting or, or doing what they can do for conservation? I would tell them a story like this about the Black Pole Warbler and think about how many miles this bird travels over how many countless communities and homes and parks. And if we really came together and built these bird friendly communities, or you just planted a corner of your yard with plants for birds and your neighbors did it, and then, the, and then the town next to you did it, and we stitched that together, these birds would be able to find the fuel that they need to travel across the entire continent. And then when they're spending a month fattening up, it's important in those places to have the same kind of bird-friendly communities so they can make this, this epic flight across the ocean where they're battling weather and wind and their wings are beating a million times and they're 12 grams, a tiny little bird. So I think that that's a powerful, this is a powerful study here and it just shows, well, first, just what a little bird can do and it's completely amazing that this bird can do that and also the importance of us doing what we can. These birds don't ask that much of us at all. They just need us to give them a little bit of what they need and they can do the rest, which is absolutely amazing and it's a very easy thing for us to do. So we know what to do, we just need to spread the word, we need to keep telling these stories like the story of the Black Pole, pole Warbler and more and more people will be engaged in this um, bird conservation community. You don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be out there doing the research, you just need to learn about these stories, we need to tell people these stories and people need to spread the word about these stories. <clears throat> the next example, this is an example most people know. Um, this is the red knot. So this is a bird that has a pretty epic migration and we've learned a lot about that migration through banding and reciting. This is just a, a crude map showing wintering areas, stopover sites, breeding areas for the red knot and a lot of band reciting and surveys have given us all this information. Um, this bird travels 18,000 miles a year in its migration, up to 18,000 miles a year, which is amazing all by itself. And this bird <clears throat> has inspired a book. So when I'm talking about telling stories are important. This bird, a whole book was written about. And the bird was named Moonbird. The book was called Moonbird. And it was Red Knot B95. And B95 was banded by Patricia Gonzalez in Argentina in 1995. This is Patricia standing with the, the Moonbird statue. This bird was recited a lot, um, New Jersey and the Delaware Bay. And when this book was written, and when the author became interested, is when he realized that this particular bird had flown the distance from the earth to the moon. I think by the last time Moonbird was seen, probably had, it was much further than that, maybe halfway back. And that bird really became the shorebird ambassador 
um, for conservation of shorebirds. It really put red knots and other shorebirds on the map. It, it, it highlighted the importance of these stopover sites in the Delaware Bay and in New Jersey, where we all hear about how these shorebirds need horseshoe crabs during migration. And I would also say it also helped these other places because red knots are also in other places, the Carolinas, the Eastern Shore of Virginia and Florida, where they're not only eating horseshoe crabs, they're also eating coquinas, which is a small clam, but it really highlighted the importance of conserving that, that marine ecosystem, that near shore environment, the beaches, reducing disturbance, and put the plight of the red knot like in the forefront and really turn people on to shorebirds, I think. And now there's lots of people in lots of places that are out on beaches where red knots go during migration or the winter and they're searching for the birds, they're searching for bands, they're contributing to the overall science of it. And it really started with them being completely floored by the fact that a bird can travel 18,000 miles in a year. It's really an amazing story. Um, and it's one worth telling. And it's one that was told well in that book. And I would suggest anybody that, that knows about this story and knows about that book and might know people that don't, to turn them onto it and it's and no one can read a story like that and not be completely amazed by it so not only did we learn critical things about red knots where they stop over places that we need to protect how the bird is doing overall these are things that are really interested to people that are doing research but also we told the story they got the public in general interested in the red knot and shorebirds in general and i think that's huge and it's a story worth telling Another sort of iconic bird, especially in the New England area, is the puffin. Um, this is a, a photo from Eastern Egg Rock, which is part of um, National Audubon Seabird Restoration Program. And for a long time, it wasn't really clear where these birds went in the winter. People would ask us. Um, I also worked for the Seabird Restoration Program. And people didn't really know where they went. You know, they went out to sea. We didn't really know where they went. So there was some, a tagging study done, putting geolocators on these puffins. And you can see there the little map on the, on the right. This, these are the results of the geolocator data. You can see that little circle in the center is around the islands that the birds are nesting on. They go up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is most likely food related. So something there during that time of year is important for those puffins. So we would, in our minds would be thinking that's a fishery in a place that's worth protecting. These puffins are diving and, and eating fish. So there needs to be a healthy fish population in these places where the birds are foraging. And then down here, coral canyons and seamounts also is where they spend the winter. So after they leave the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they're heading down there. This information was part of the information that was used to get our New England Canyons and Seamounts National Monument passed. So banding these puffins and tracking these puffins turned into a national monument, marine sanctuary, where this area is protected for these birds. And it's so critically important. And it's not just for puffins. Fisheries data was included in that, all sorts of marine data, but the puffins played a role in that. And so did the banding of puffins. Without that, we wouldn't have known that the birds were going there and how important that area is. So it was a really important data to feed to Audubon policy staff who helped get this push through and others and they used this data and they told this story and it turned into a national monument, which I think is huge. I mean, a huge victory for conservation and a huge victory for um, banded birds. Also, something that came from banding birds up there um, at Project Puffin was there's an adopt a puffin program. So puffins now have this really cool story. How they, I mean, they're nesting in rock crevices these birds are banded so you can follow them over time. And every year you can add to this story that these birds are telling. So if you adopt a puffin, you get this bird's history, everything that we've learned about this bird since it was banded. And then every year you get new photos of the bird. You get to know if the bird raised a chick, all of these things, how many times it was sighted. So by having these birds banded and, and then people adopting them, and, and it's a very, very popular program, it's turning people on to puffins and then these birds in general. And I think it influences the way people think about conservation. It influences the way they think about seabirds. It makes this a little bit more personal, which I think is important. I know a lot of people and, you know, I don't name the birds I ban, but when you do and you make it personal, 
people get an attachment to it. I see that down here with my birds. I see that with other banded birds that spend time in Southwest Florida. And it's a really powerful thing. And it gets people personally involved. These are their resources too. And they're more apt to vote and fight for things that are good for birds. So I think that that's another huge benefit that we get from banding. All right, another bird, the bar-tailed godwit. This bird is pretty amazing. I mean, they're all amazing. This bird is close to one of the most amazing. And this happens to be a picture that was taken right here in Southwest Florida this past winter, not a normal place for a bar-tailed godwit to be. Pretty amazing that it was here and it was a very popular sighting. But this bird, this bird does crazy things. I mean, just this bird's story, even if you didn't learn anything to manage it, would be enough to put a band on it and to be able to tell people what this bird can do. So in the fall, in Alaska, these birds congregate on mud flats and they just eat and eat and eat. And while they're doing that, they're increasing the size of their digestive tract. So they have that ability, which is pretty cool. The cells in the digestive tract get bigger so they can absorb nutrients better. They're more efficient. They eat, they eat, they eat, they eat. And while they're doing that, they're absorbing more calories. Their flight muscles in their chest expand 50%. I mean, I can't even do that in the gym and they do it by eating. So that's pretty crazy. And their heart increases 30%. And that's all because they're about to leave and they need to migrate. So when they're about to leave, they don't need that digestive tract anymore. So you might as well just digest it or let it atrophy. And that's what they do. They don't need it anymore. So it kind of disappears for all intents and purposes. And they have giant chest muscles, the heart's bigger, they're ready to migrate. <clears throat> the wind starts to blow, maybe out of the Northeast, they all lift off the ground and they take off. And who knows where they stop or where they go, but if you put a satellite tag on these birds, you can learn these things. So this is what one of them looked like. This is bird E7. This is a project that Audubon Alaska did. And you can see this bird fl flew 11,000 680 kilometers without stopping in one shot to New Zealand, which is pretty amazing. That's the longest nonstop migration that we know about. It's an impossibly long time, does it in about seven days, which is amazing. That's nonstop flight for seven days. And then it, goes, then it ends up in New Zealand. And when it reverses, you can read this, 10, a little over 10,000 kilometers to the Yellow Sea, where it's on mud flats there refueling, and then back to Alaska. I mean, really 30,000 kilometers in, in an annual migration, which is really amazing. And for researchers, this is important to know, of course, because those mudflats in Alaska, if you know that bird's making a nonstop, almost 12,000 kilometer flight over open ocean, those mudflats are really, really important. So we need to protect those mudflats. Then when it gets to where it's going, obviously, it doesn't have much left. It needs, it needs those areas protected. Also very good information. And then the Yellow Sea, I think most importantly, where mudflats are disappearing there at an alarmingly high rate is a critical, critical site for many different shorebirds, not just, not just the Bartell Godwit. So we need to protect that. So that whole thing, that whole thing is really important. But then just the story, just this bird flying that far is amazing and just telling that story and people that I've told it to it's like a, it makes their jaw drop because it's amazing and then you know people are going to ask well does the bird sleep researchers at the Max Planck Institute worked with frigate birds and they put something on their transmitters on their head where they can monitor these things while the birds are flying and what these birds have is a, a uni hemispheric um, slow wave sleeps cycle so the, really what that means is they, they're sleeping with one eye open. Half their brain is sleeping. The other half of their brain is awake. And they can switch that back and forth. And they found that, you know, on land where they might sleep 12 hours a day, they're only sleeping about three or 4% of the time, but they can do that. So they're sleeping while they're flying, while half of their brain is still functioning just to, to know where they are, to watch out for predators, whatever the case may be. So they're awake, but they're sleeping and they're aware, but they're not and they're flying 12,000 kilometers to um, New Zealand, which is pretty amazing. So those are the types of things through banding and through research that we can learn about these birds, which is, which is incredible. And for the average person, what's, what wows them is not the fact that we know 
we have to protect the mudflats in Alaska, but we do, of course we do. And it's really, really important that we do. But just this story of this epic migration, this little bird is making that long, long trip and doing it year after year after year, which is incredible. I mean, these birds can live a decently long time. So they're flying 30,000 miles every year and they might do it for 10 years, which is amazing. Now this bird, anybody that knows me well, that's watching this, I mean, I love terns. I mean, I think they're the coolest birds around. I really love common terns, but this bird, if it, if it was watching this presentation, listening to me talking about red knots and bar tail godwits and anything like that would just be looking at me and being like, hold my beer. This bird migrates. This bird, 110 gram bird, little dainty thing. They call them sea swallows, really pretty in flight. This bird, has the longest migration of anything on earth and it's pretty crazy. So you can see this bird's built to fly, the long pointy wings. If you've seen them, of course you guys have seen these, any species of tern, very graceful flyers, they're very powerful flyers. Fish and Wildlife Service and again Audubon did a project where they put geolocators on these birds um, to see what this migration looked like, where they went, all of these things that we kind of really didn't know. I mean, we knew they traveled far, but we didn't really know the extent of it until we were able to do a study like this. And with this type of tag, this, this tag needs to be retrieved. So the following year, the year after, you'll retrieve this bird when it comes back to the island to breed, and then you'll download the data and see what it tells you. So this is the um, fall migration track of three Arctic terns. And you can see these areas highlighted here for researchers. These are important areas. You can see the birds are spending time there. They're flying back and forth and they're kind of staying in these areas. You can tell by that, the density of that squiggled line. So probably that means these are like stations or areas of the ocean that these birds are using to refuel. So they're very important for these birds. I mean, when you're making a migration like this, your food sources better be where you think they're gonna be. So this can have implications for conservation all over the, all over the globe at least um, the Northern and Southern Hemisphere, where we're, we're identifying these hotspots. And chances are, they're not just important for Arctic terns, but Arctic tern is the bird that we use to find them. Here's another um, fall migration, a, a Southern migration of five Arctic terns. You can see a little bit different route, kind of more straight down the middle of the Atlantic, but you can you notice those two areas, those hotspot areas where they're using to feed, they're the same. So that just reinforces that that importance of those sites. And here's what they're doing in the winter. This is 11 birds back and forth along the Antarctic shelf. And you can see there that really dense blob, the Weddell Sea seems to be a very important place where these Arctic terns are spending a whole lot of their time. So another critically important piece of the Arctic terns puzzle and probably many other things. And here's the migration in the spring, which this one's interesting because you can see that it's kind of, they're not really stopping in those places. Hopefully these birds were fat and happy from spending their winter in Antarctica and they're just getting back pretty much to the breeding ground. So when that, when the time of year comes and that urge hits them to go back to those, those colonies and breed and procreate, pass on their genes, that's a drive that just brings those birds all the way, all the way back to the Gulf of Maine and to Seal Island and Matinicus Rock and places like that where, they, where, they're, where they're breeding and they're spending a few months every summer trying to raise chicks. So when you put this all together, it looks like this. So the average one, we've, we've had 88,915 kilometers, which is just under 60,000 miles. 110 gram bird, 60,000 miles a year. And when I was at Project Puffin, there was a bird there that was trapped that was about 28 or 29 years old. So that bird has been doing this 60,000 miles a year for 28 or 29 years with 1.8 million miles flown back and forth to breed in the Gulf of Maine. And because of the population declines that, we're, that we see with these Arctic terns, these sites that they, where they're foraging on their migration are critically important. Also the sites that they're feeding on around the colonies are critically important. So I think that this story, I mean, it's an amazing story, just telling this story without the conservation or management implications of it is just amazing. And especially if anybody's seen an Arctic tern, I mean, it's a little bird. And when you have it in your hand, 
I mean, it doesn't, it hardly weighs anything. And it's flying 60,000 miles a year, which is just incredible. It's really incredible that it can do that. And this is a story I'd like to tell, well, because I think turns are so cool and I think everybody should love turns. But besides that, it's an amazing story. And I think that it's one worth telling. And I think these are the kinds of stories that we all need to keep telling. So the final example I'm gonna use, <clears throat> this bird, a lot of people know this bird too. This is Wisdom, that's her name, is Wisdom. She's an albatross, a Lisan albatross, banded in 1956 as an adult. So that would make that bird six, about 69 or 70 years old at least right now. It's the oldest known wild bird in existence, which is pretty incredible. These are long-lived seabirds, and prior to this, it was, it was thought 30 or 40 years. But this bird has obviously proved that it's, it can be much, much longer than that. And I think for this bird, for me, mostly what this bird for me does, and it gives me hope that there, there is hope for these birds. Because so often that we're hearing about all the plastic in the ocean and the long lines and all of these horrible things that are killing lots of seabirds. And that's true. And it's terrible. And it's a problem that we're, we need to fix. It's a problem that we are working on. But I think you also have to at some point when you're reading these articles and it's driving you crazy because you're seeing birds dying of plastic and all the horrible stuff, you have to think about this bird. And this bird's still out there now. This bird's still alive. This bird's still raising chicks. Somehow this bird has navigated all of those pitfalls for so, so many years and is still alive. And there's no reason to think that there's not other moon birds. So I think for this, for me, this bird basically just represents hope and that there is hope and that what we're all doing, what everybody on this, watching this talk is trying to do, all my friends out there that are doing the same thing I do and, and helping birds and trying to save birds and doing bird research, there's hope that what we're doing is making a difference. And birds like this kind of give us that little bit of motivation, that extra motivation that we need to keep doing this work. And I think it's important that we don't quit. We don't quit supporting bird conservation. We don't quit doing what we all do as professionals. We don't quit telling these stories. Because I can tell you that right now there's an Arctic tern flying from the Gulf of Maine down to Antarctica. And that bird doesn't even know what quit is. Like quit isn't part of what these birds do. They don't give up. They don't quit. They just keep doing the same thing. And they're relying on us not to quit. They need us not to quit because if we quit, then they're, gonna, they're, they're just gonna disappear. So I think that's where I'll leave this talk. I think that we need to keep telling the story of birds, learn as much as we can about them, learn about, there's countless banding projects up and down um, the East and West Coast, all across the center of the country, wherever you live, there's somebody somewhere doing some kind of project where they're tagging and banding birds, they're learning about the amazing things birds do. So I encourage everybody to find those things if you don't know them already. Learn as much as you can about them and tell people that you know about them and get people that maybe aren't conservation minded or don't think about it first. I know it's hard now. There's so many other things to think about and other things that we should think about first, but we got to just keep repeating these stories. We got to keep telling these stories. We need to not quit. And I think if we do that, there's going to be plenty more moonbirds, plenty more wisdoms, lots of 28 year old Arctic terns. We just have to make sure that we keep telling this story. And now I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, yeah, wisdom is definitely one of my favorite birds for sure. So we have a bunch of questions for you. The first one is, when you're banding birds, you know, birds fly, they run away. How do you actually safely get a hold of them so that you can ban them? It's a good question. So for me, what I'm doing here on my project is kind of like cheating. I ban black skimmer chicks and I do it before they can fly. So I can just use a butterfly net and hand capture them. So it's um, pretty simple for me. Um, if you're banding songbirds, a lot of times, you use a mist net, which is a net that the birds can't see and they fly into it. They kind of get a little tangled and then skilled trained people extract those birds, ban them and release them. There's different sorts of traps, walk-in box traps, something called a bow net that kind of springs a net over a nest. Um, those are other ways that we would, we would trap maybe seabirds on a nest or something like that. 
that can fly, they would settle down on the nest and we would spring a bow net over the top or they would walk into a treadle trap and then they can't, and then they're trapped, they can't fly. We extract the bird carefully, process it quick. And I, I would like to say that it's always done bird first. Anybody that's doing it correctly is trained, permitted, and the bird safety is always, always, always the first thing that we think about. And if there's any sort of um, environmental condition or anything else that might um, jeopardize the bird safety, then banding doesn't occur. When birds migrate, how high up in the sky are they flying? I was, it was funny as I was thinking about that earlier today, full disclosure, about every bird that I talked to because I thought someone would ask me and I didn't think I would know the answer. But I can say um, they've had um, birds, I think uh, Rupel's griffin vulture um, at 39,000 feet, like witnessed from an airplane. So they can go really, really high. And, and what's cool about birds, well, another cool thing about birds is that when birds are up at that altitude, their wings have to work harder because the air is less dense. There's also less oxygen. So they hyperventilate when they're flying, which raises the alkalinity of their blood. And then they have an adaptation to be able to tolerate that high alkal alkaline blood. Um, and then like with people, when you hyperventilate, you get dizzy, but birds can counter that. So they can intake more oxygen flying at those high altitudes by hyperventilating during flight. So I would say up to 30, 39,000 feet. I've also heard that they can go higher. Like a mallard duck, for instance, I think 21,000 feet. So you just think of a duck flying over a pond, but when it's migrating, it can be over 20,000 feet in the air. Wow, that's amazing. Um, do terns migrate alone? In groups. Yeah, so they'll usually you'll see these staging flocks. Um, People up and down the East Coast will see groups of birds, maybe the common terns and Arctic terns from Maine, or, well, I shouldn't say Arctic terns. You don't often see those on the beach, but the common terns will, you know, stage in places where they're resting and refueling. Our least terns kind of do it here. So they're kind of leaving and migrating in groups and kind of returning to the breeding area in groups as well. What makes a bird a boreal bird? nesting up in the boreal forest at least that's my my take on it and if there's you know because i'm definitely there's a hundred people on them watching this that know more about songbirds and warblers and boreal nesting birds than i do i kind of faked it on that one um but i, I think nesting in the boreal forest is that's my answer and if i'm wrong one of my smarter songbird friends could chime in if they're on this talk and correct me <laughs> i'll look out for that um, Deborah on Zoom is asking my absolute favorite question. If you see a banded bird and you take a picture, how do you report that? Okay, so if you're in Florida, where I hope you are, and you're out looking for my banded birds from my research project, these um, links on the screen right here, you could send the photo right to me. Um, but if not, the Bird Banding Laboratory, um, you can go online and go into the, go to the United States Bird Banding Laboratory, the USGS runs it, and there's, you can navigate that website and report the bird there. They're the ones that issue all the federal permits, like I have a master banding permit, and anything I band, all that information gets sent to them, so they're the keeper of all of it. And I would say even if you did send that recite to me, you could also report that there and they, they keep all those recites and they'll send you the information about that bird. So it's really, it's really neat. You can like recite a turn on the beach and find out that it was banded in North Carolina, you know, 25 years ago when it was a chick and you're seeing it wherever you are. So it's, it's pretty cool. So yeah, go out there and look for them. And then the bird banding lab, you can go in there and report it. It'll ask you where you saw it, all of those things. If you have a photo, that's great. And pay attention to where on the leg the bands are when you're reciting, and that'll be important later when you're reporting it. Great, and I've seen a few iterations of this question. You know, if you're interested in becoming a bird banding volunteer, how does one even go about doing that? So I, I would research different, you know, different projects wh wherever you live. Um, it, it, you know, there could be songbird banding stations that allow volunteers or willing to train volunteers. I mean, someone that's willing to be a regular participant and that will be coming multiple times um, is very valuable. Um, 
and I, again, just look for research opportunities. I think down here through my shorebird stewardship program, my volunteers, you know, learned about my banding project and there's other banding projects in Florida and all the places that I've worked in Ben, um, there's kind of a public face of these organizations, whether it be Audubon or the Nature Conservancy or different um, organizations doing songbird banding. You can find those stations, you can visit those stations, talk to the folks there and try to find out, shoot an email to them and tell them that you're interested. And I think most, most people are, are eager to get more and more people involved, at least to come out and see what they do. So I would look around in my local area for bird banding projects, check like the, the local conservation organizations, the state, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service and see who's doing what sort of research in certain places. And you can copy this email down off the screen. And if you shot me an email, um, I can help you look. Um, so there's a lot of places that I would already know about, especially if you're somewhere where there's salt water. I know a lot of people doing a lot of cool things in a lot of places. So I can help steer you in a direction. So feel free, any question that you have like that to, to shoot me an email and I can try to steer you or connect you with the right people. Awesome. So we have a few different questions, but I'm going to keep it on bird banding for a minute. Uh, as this picture actually shows, bird bands are coming in different colors. So Linda mm -hmm. would like to know, what do the different colors of the bird bands represent? Okay, so lots of different, they could, lots of different things. They, they could mean lots of different things. So there's something called the Pan American um, Shorebird Banding Protocol, where the color might be a country origin. So North America uses green, that red knot, B95, Argentina uses orange, Chile uses red, um, Brazil uses blue. So it could mean that, or it could be a state color. We're doing black skimmers. Um, we're using green here. Other states are using different colors. Uh, New York's using yellow, all Long Island. I mean, uh, New Jersey is using blue. Or it could be like this bird here, you see it's got an alphanumeric band. This bird was banded. There's been a, like, a pretty long-term banding project that's really cool. And there's a lot of good stories to tell from this project in the Florida Panhandle banding snowy plovers and Wilson's plovers. This bird was banded in the Panhandle and it's got an alphanumeric band on it, a green one. And then it's got these two, which makes that, that a unique, it's a unique individual. So you might see, let's say a piping plover that has just a flag, a green flag, let's say, and it's got a stack of color bands, two color bands on each lower leg. Those colors and the order that those colors are in and the leg that they're on identifies that bird as an individual. So, so all of those colors are important. And instead of having a number, like my skimmer that, that I showed that was C48, this bird would have a color combination that made it an individual. So it could be green flag, red over blue, white over yellow, or something like that. So those are important, the order of the colors are important. So it could tell us an individual, could tell us a country. There's lots of different, different things it could say. Does the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission use silver bands? Yes, so, well, it's really, um, it's really the uh, federal banding. So the banding um, permits and permissions come from the federal government. So the federal banding lab, and they're the ones that issued the banders like myself. Um, I get bands, they sent me bands, metal bands for black skimmers. And when I started banding them, they wanted me to use a, a silver metal band, which is like the bird's social security number, really. It's the federal band number. And then I also use my alphanumeric field readable green band that we saw on the slide. There are instances of the banding project in Pinellas County they don't use metal or they didn't use metal starting in 2015 because the bird was uniquely banded with a green plastic band, they didn't require metal. But now they want us to put metal on them. In most banding programs, they do use that metal band, um, no matter where they are in the country, some sort of metal band along with their, their color or alphanumeric field readable bands or whatever else they're using. What if you find a banded bird, Adam, but it's no longer alive? So that is also important. So when you're reporting a band to the bird banding lab, it will ask you, you, that'll be part of the questions that you're filling out. So if the bird was seen as a live bird or if it was found deceased. So that's all part of it. And you would still report that because then we know that the bird wearing those bands with that combination is no longer part of the population. Let's us know how long the birds live, of course, where it was when it died. And also 
that combination is now something that could be used again on another bird. So that's, a, that's really important. So you want to report a deceased bird with a ban just as much as a live bird. So I'm going to combine these, these next two questions because they're quite similar. So Adam, it's a two-part question. So is there any chance that the bans can affect the birds or their survival? And then the related question is, do they come off slash do the birds ever try to take their bans off? Okay, so <clears throat> banding has been going on a long time now. So the different um, banding schemes and sizes that they allow for various species of birds. So you would get permission to ban, you know, Wilson's plovers or something else. And there's a size ban that you have to use, which over time we've learned that can be used on the bird safely. Where see that that green band on this picture here, that that's a, the right diameter band to sit above that joint not fall over that joint and not impede the bird in any way. The same with the color bands on the lower leg. And then you can see the upper, the upper left has a metal. So when it's done correctly, it's very, very safe for the birds. But sometimes even when it's done correctly, something can happen. Maybe the, the ceiling of the band didn't take as well as it should have, or a band wears, or it falls off. A lot of times you see these color banded birds that are missing a band, so you can't really tell the individual. Um, but there are instances when you do everything right, where something happens, where that green band could slip over that joint, and then that would cause a problem for that bird, that's true. And it is seen sometimes, but I would say, like I said earlier, most people, most banders are, um, are very bird first. They're very careful with what they do. And that sort of thing, that sort of injury is not common. It's not common at all. So I would say it is, it's very safe. And really when we're banding, like for instance, when I'm banding these black skimmers, I mean, from the time I get that bird to I release it, it's less than five minutes and the bird's on its way. The bands are secure. We haven't seen any problems with the bands. So I think it is, it is very safe. And occasionally we can see injuries from bands. And any time that it was noticed where bands were causing injuries, like if, if a banding project starts and the only way to know anything is to try it and something was obviously happening that wasn't quite right, those kind of things are stopped and they don't do it anymore. And they work out the kinks if, if they can be worked out and they don't ban them. I will say that I have heard stories and I have a friend that's banding out on the West Coast and if they ban plover chicks of a certain age, above a certain age, they just don't stop picking at the bands. So they're just distracted, which could be a huge problem, right? They're distracted from doing everything else that they need to do, like eat and watch out for predators. So they ban birds less than seven days old. And the birds that they had banded when they were doing that picking of the bands, they trapped them again because they can't fly and they removed them. So they, 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 they watch the birds. And I think that's another thing I should mention that a lot of times once we band a bird, we don't just put it down and walk away. We stay and we watch and we see what the bird does and how it's acting and behaving with those bands. So usually those kind of problems are noticed pretty quick and that problem is nipped in the bud before it turns into a serious problem. It's possible for it to happen, but with really conscientious experienced banders is very, very minimal. And you touched on this, but just to flush out your answer a little bit, you know, the, what do you do to make sure there's no stress during the process of banding? So we try to do it, I mean, like I said, we try to make it, um, do it quickly. So, and then we're always monitoring the bird. So if at any time the bird is showing signs of stress, like when I'm banding these black skimmers, they're not, they're not panting. We're doing it when it's cool enough. The environmental conditions need to be right and we do it fast. We do it to a, spe a specification that the bird can tolerate. And we're watching always for signs of stress. I've had birds, like maybe four or five birds in a, in a box where we're collecting them to ban four or five and release them, where I thought one looked like it was getting a little bit stressed out, maybe getting bullied by the other ones, or it was too hot or something. And I just let it, let it go and it leaves. So if you notice, we notice those problems, we remedy that problem. And then if it looks like, you know, the day's getting too warm, we just stop banding. I mean, we don't do it when it's not right. But I would say that most, most of the birds that I've banded, especially here in Florida, but I've banned lots of birds in lots of places, a lot, most of those birds have been recited, especially immediately thereafter the banding. So the week after the banding, for two weeks after the banding, we're seeing those birds every day or several times. So there's no real indication 
on the projects that I've worked on that the banding was causing any sort of stress that was harming the birds. This is a question about sleep actually, and um, if we need to follow up, we can. So when birds are sleeping while flying, are they just going in a straight line? Do they change directions? I mean, so, I mean, this is, um, well, obviously when I give my answer, you'll know I'm not an expert. So this is not anything that's in my, um, my, my field of expertise, but I've done reading about it. So I know that much, but they did, um, the study that Max Planck did was with frigate birds and frigate birds were soaring and circling while they were sleeping. And funny enough thing with frigate birds, they also can turn off both hemispheres of their brain, shut both their eyes and still fly and soar. So they can be fully asleep and even some of them even further entered REM sleep for a few seconds, which is a deep sleep. So there, I think it helps that they're out over open ocean so they can't fly into anything. But yeah, they, they can go in straight lines. And as far as I know, and anybody feel free to jump in that's a bird sleep scientist out there, um, they, can, they can fly in circles, straight lines, whatever they need to do. Do birds ever outgrow their brands? No. So that's a good, that's actually a good question. So some birds like um, terns, you can ban them on the day they hatch and their leg can accommodate that band. Other birds like these black skimmers in Florida, we wait because of the bands we use till the bird's over 20 days old where the leg is the right size to accommodate those, those bands. And pretty much those birds are fledging full size. So right after we ban them, they're flight capable and they're pretty much the size of the adult then. So the bands don't cause any harm because the bird is growing. So that shouldn't be a problem. If it's done correctly, that should never be a problem. All right, Adam, this is going to be the last one and it's the most difficult. Are you ready? Sure. So you have banded tons of different species all across the country. What is your favorite bird to band and then track? So, well, yeah, I mean, the, my favorite bird is a common tern. So my answer then will be the common tern. I just like, I like common terns. And it's not necessarily because of their migration or anything that they do um, that we learn from banding, but I like common terns because they're super, super ornery and aggressive. Like if you go in a common tern colony that has chicks or eggs, you're gonna leave bleeding. And I love that. They're loud, they're aggressive, they're boisterous little birds and they attack anything that comes near their colony. And I just think that's really cool. And I love them. I mean, by far my favorite bird. Yeah, I don't blame you there. All right, so Adam, thank you so much. Uh, a few people have asked where this recording will be available. I was a tiny bit unclear in the beginning. So in addition to having a YouTube recording available on our website in the next few days, this talk is already available on both the Audubon Florida Facebook page as well as the National Audubon Society Facebook page. So you can go back and uh, view it anytime. Uh, these are our email addresses to contact us. Definitely follow us on social media. We post a lot of pictures from Adam and a lot of coastal bird updates. And just thank you all so much for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon. Have a great rest of your evening. Thanks, Adam. Thank you.